So I'm pretty sure I'm getting paid for today. I mean, I didn't check, but I'm pretty sure I am. And I can hardly believe that this day counts as a day of work. To me, it has been just so fulfilling and, and joyful to look back at the, um, the giants whose shoulders we stand on. And for our trainees and younger people in the field, you're gonna be standing on our shoulders and where this will be 50 years from now, you know, only the sky's the limit. So it has been a real pleasure for me today to be here. The other thing I've realized is putting together a phenomenal group of speakers is really bad if you're gonna give closing remarks. <laughs> but I'm gonna try anyway. So, find the right button. We all know it started here with the EMI Mark I scanner. These are four images of the brain from, from that scanner in 1973. And these are four images from essentially the same levels of the brain of the same individual 30 years later. And you can see the tremendous gains in image quality. Now in 2023, we collect our data isotropically so we can reconstruct in the sagittal or the coronal or axial or 3D or dual energy. We have so many more options uh, before us. So what might the future of brain imaging hold? This is work from uh, Dr. Hao Gong and Shai Leng. And we have made here with the CNN, the Convolutional Neural Network, and VMI stands for Virtual Monoenergetic Image. We've created an image that has so much more contrast in it because we are synthesizing it as if it was acquired at 18 keV. And so the phenomenal part of the work that they've done is that they have been able to synthesize this, increase the contrast, not increase the noise, and preserve resolution. Okay, we've heard about the dynamic spatial reconstructor and the number of prominent male faculty who all went on to have very uh, luminary careers in medical imaging. This is another contribution uh, from Mayo. And um, this, this wrap up is actually from the perspective of looking at the things that came out of Mayo. And um, I mean, I've always felt privileged to work here. I knew the story of the EMI, but it is only as the story has evolved and unfolded more and more to me that I look at this and say, wow, we are doing coronary artery uh, images in the you know, 1980s. This scanner, as we know, had multiple CT sources. So it was the first multi-source scanner. It had multiple image slices. So it was a multi-slice scanner. So it was really the forebearer of much of modern CT. It did not have the contrast resolution we needed at that point in time. The images were acquired with direct injections to the heart. But in this paper from Dr. Rittman in Science in October, 1980, we can see these coronary arteries that could be viewed and rotated from any dimension, pushing through that three-dimensional space to see the coronary arteries. Now in 2023, we've got images that look like this. Here is a coronary stent. We've got the right coronary, left coronary, uh, left circumflex, capillary muscles, and even the um, uh, coronary veins here. And Eric, I hope I got that right, because otherwise um, you'll never let me live that down. <laughs> but they had uh, the foresight to say this contrast resolution thing, if that could be solved, if we could have a high speed volumetric scanner like the DSR that had higher density resolution, we might be able to go after the heart with peripheral vein injections. And that is indeed very much the case. Uh, these are images from today's technology. So this year, David Blumke and uh, his colleague, uh, Dr. Lima, produced a list of the top 10 list of cardiovascular imaging developments that they expect to see by 2040. They believe coronary CT will be totally automated. It will be routinely uh, include estimates of coronary flow and pressure gradients. The main use of coronary CT they predict will be in preventive cardiology, a place that coronary calcium scanning has had, but not coronary imaging. And they predict that photon counting CT will replace conventional CT for coronary artery and pretty much everything else. I'm not sure I think that we're gonna to get to phase contrast uh, CT imaging of the heart, but let's never say never. 
So where might the future go? We have gotten very fast. We have dual source, we have other algorithms to uh, mathematically try to reduce uh, the time of one shutter speed of an image. This is work, uh, again, from colleagues, uh, Dr. Gong and Leng, um, where we, with deep learning, are training um, an al um, a network to reduce the temporal resolution. It still says 75 milliseconds, but you can see there at that red arrow how much sharper the vessel lumen has gotten. So I think we are gonna see more deep learning. I don't know the gantries are gonna spin much faster. I don't know that we're gonna put a lot more tubes on the detectors or on the gantry, but I do know we're gonna use deep learning to uh, continue to improve temporal resolution. Now the CTM, the CT mammography unit also was first deployed at Mayo Clinic. Uh, this is a photograph here. Dr. Giswold had an NIH grant working on this. He was the department chair who, who hired me, so I always appreciate John. And today, Breast CT is commercial. There's uh, this uh, by Koenig, and there's another system by Advanced Breast CT, which is a company uh, that was uh, founded by a colleague and friend of many of ours, Dr. Willie Callender, who played a tremendous role in the advent of spiral CT imaging. Where might we go in the future? You've seen a peek at this image. We've got a mammogram compared to a breast CT on a whole body CT scanner, and we're seeing microcalcifications. Now, we couldn't see those through the noise, but we employed some of our deep learning denoising to bring those out. And we are right now in the middle of a trial with both non-contrast scans for calcifications and also contrast enhanced CT mammograms <laughs> for breast cancer staging. So this came out of publication in 1993. This was about the Z coverage of spiral CT in that time frame. Uh, we heard about limits to the X-ray tube, to data handling. And uh, even almost a decade ago, we could scan from essentially the head to the toe in just a few seconds and reconstruct section thicknesses that were equivalent to 0.6 millimeters. Now, Mayo Clinic also has a, a strong legacy in screening techniques. They uh, worked, uh, Drs. Dan Johnson, Amy Hara, J.G. Fletcher, and others in the space of CT colonography and were really pioneers in that technique, uh, producing, uh, these are just four of many publications on the ability to use CT to non-invasively screen the colon for colorectal cancer. Now, originally, Medicare uh, denied reimbursement for this, but through the work of many groups doing studies, and we have now meta-analysis showing good sensitivity and good results, uh, as of 2022, Medicare now pays for CT colonography screening. So again, that was something Mayo uh, and the pioneers really had a vision for, and uh, their tenacity uh, paid off. Spiral CT for lung cancer screening. I remember working on this project when I first arrived as with the CT colonography. And Mayo had done a lung cancer screening with radiography, didn't have very positive results. And so when Spiral CT came along, they redid the study um, and published this work. The National Lung Cancer Screening Trial came out and showed a remarkable 20% decrease in the number of deaths among participants in the arm that had CT compared to the arm that had uh, radiographic x-rays. And then on February 10th, 2022, Medicare approved coverage for low-dose CT for screening for lung cancer. So um, Thomas is not always serious, as can be shown here. <laughs> so in June 2022, uh, 2004, it's hard to say that because it sounds like a long time ago, we opened the CT Clinical Innovation Center. The idea had been bouncing around my brain for several years because I had been working with these investigators on CT colonography, on CT lung cancer screening, on CT coronary calcium screening, and so many other projects. And I said, hey, we, we have a big community here, but we're not kind of all in the same room at any same time or same place. And so uh, with collaboration from an industry partner, Siemens uh, believed in us. And I said, if I can provide the space, will you loan us a scanner? And the Clinical Innovation Center was born. 
So with that, we've had a lot of technology first. And this is some of the funnest part of my job is being able to play in a sandbox with all the new toys. We had the first US Sensation 64 when the, when the center opened. We had the first in the world dual source CT scanner, which was only fitting given our background with multiple source scanners with the DSR. We had the first in the US adaptive spiral CT, definition flash dual source, somatone force dual source. And then we had the first in the world and for a year, the only in the world somatone count photon counting detector CT scanner. And that was installed in 2014, but I think Thomas, we started talking about that probably as early as 2012 when we wrote a NIH grant to help with the project. And we had the, the first in the US and the only in the US count plus, and then had the privilege of having the first in the US Neotome Alpha, wasn't called that then, but it became the Neotome Alpha when it was commercially released. So it has been uh, a tremendous opportunity for us to have this partnership because I don't build CT scanners. Eric was brave enough to build a CT scanner. I don't build CT scanners, but partnering with a company that builds CT scanners, we could do things in the clinical domain to provide feedback, to test out ideas on prototypes and uh, together really make a lot of changes in, in the fate of CT. So here's a photograph of the Neotome Alpha and just uh, some of the pictures. The clinical state of the art almost looks blurry by comparison. We are also in the Innovation Center and Andy Missard is here and a lot of uh, uh, credit goes to him working on CT noise reduction with convolutional neural networks. Here's an original image, it's a good image. But when we denoise it with this convolutional neural network, it comes out to be a better image so much that you can now see this subtle hepatic metastases just pop right out. So some future applications of artificial intelligence. These are two images from the same patient. The traditional is on the left, a five millimeter slice. That's very traditional for a brain image. On the right is a 0.75 millimeter slice thickness and yet the noise is lower than the five millimeter. We maintain spatial resolution and we've improved the contrast resolution. You can see those subarachnoid hemorrhages just pop out because we have decreased partial volume averaging. We've gone from a five millimeter cut to a 0.75 millimeter cut. And believe me, I never saw, thought I would see the day that we did brain images at 0.75 millimeters. So we think that is a future application. We are looking at not just the improvements in image quality, but the improvements in workflow, because how many series do we reconstruct? Sharp and smooth and thin and thick and bone and soft tissue. What if we just reconstruct one very sharp image and then on the fly dial in the level of resolution uh, that we need? And finally, you've heard about the, the fast, uh, fast high pitch scanning that is possible with dual source CT. It works great. We scan our kids without anesthesia. And uh, under uh, guidance of Dr. Lee Fang Yu, we've been looking at how can we take that from dual source technology to single source technology. And so this is work from, again, AI enabled high pitch CT scans. So in closing, Mayo Clinic has been at the forefront of technical and clinical advancements in CT since it was brought to North America 50 years ago. I really had no idea how rich the history was until I started pulling all of this together. The CT Clinical Innovation Center is a multidisciplinary team dedicated to continuing this rich heritage of innovation in CT at Mayo Clinic. And CT did not die after the introduction of MR. I think it just keeps getting better and better. So I wanna thank the tremendous uh, group, the team we have in the CT Clinical Innovation Center. They are what make it a joy and a privilege to come to work every day. And um, with that, I wanna draw this symposium to a close. Just to note that if you want to stick around, we're gonna take some photographs here in the auditorium. And then if the faculty would join us in walking over to the Mayo lobby, we'll take some photos with the EMI scanner. If you have not gone by to see the scanner, please go by and see the exhibit. It's on the first floor of the Mayo building. We're in the subway level, one, one level down. No, Rochester, Minnesota does not have a subway system, but we're in the subway level. <laughs>
And um, please head over to see that uh, scanner. And so with that, I wanna thank everyone. It's been a tremendous day and a privilege for me to uh, pull all this together and spend time with everyone. So thank you for the virtual audience and for those that are here in person. With that, we close.